In this video, we're going to continue our exploration of doing an autocomplete for an HTML input field by using jQuery. Just a couple of quick points on these slides, and then we're going to jump right in. First of all, I have a previous video where we imported jQuery by using essentially a URL, and I did a simple autocomplete with a predefined list, where the autocomplete is embedded in the HTML page. And that works great if you need to do a quick and dirty autocomplete. I tend to think a good rule is maybe up to 50 autocomplete items, like number of US states uh, plus territories and like brings you up to about 55. Beyond that, you might want to pull into a data source, especially if the data changes frequently, unlike the number of US states or the number of countries in the world. So in this video, we're going to look at how to do an autocomplete when we're pulling from a data source. A couple caveats that we're going to need to look at. We're going to need to change the source attribute from square bracket and then strings in quotes, comma, strings in quotes, so on and so forth, close square bracket to simply an endpoint or a URL that's entirely in quotes. In other words, this is subtle but very important. A jQuery autocomplete has a source attribute. If it sees that that source attribute begins with an open square bracket and ends with a closed square bracket, then it, is, it assumes that's an array of the suggestions that it should populate in that autocomplete. However, if the value that corresponds to source begins with a double quote and ends with a double quote, it assumes that that is some kind of endpoint or URL where that URL is going to return a list of items that qualify for the autocomplete. So subtle, but very important because if you happen to put quotes around the brackets, it'll think that's a URL. Now, one note here, the endpoint or the URL that you use must be from the same domain that is serving up the web page, or it has to be what's called cores compliant, kind of like uh, filtering it through some JavaScript to make sure that it's safe, doesn't pose a security risk. That threw me off for a little bit because I was trying to pull in a JSON stream from another site and I wasn't getting any autocomplete suggestions when I started typing. Then I started to pull in data from an endpoint on my own application, and I found that it was auto-completing. So be careful about that. We're not going to cover cores in this video. We're just going to cover uh, the autocomplete coming from the same domain. One other note, when you have the square brackets in the array, jQuery figures out the autocomplete for you. In other words, as you're typing, jQuery will automatically filter that list down. Not the case when you're using an endpoint or URL in quotes. In that case, it counts on you to figure a way to narrow the, that list down. What it does is as you're typing, it passes this term equals name value pair onto the URL that you're specifying in the endpoint with double quotes. So if you don't do anything with that term equals, you'll find that the autocomplete just shows a list of all possible suggestions and never filters it. It's up to you to filter it on the server side by handling this term equals. We're going to be able to cover nearly all of this in this one video, from changing jQuery in our HTML page to point to an endpoint, then we're going to make the endpoint, then we're going to kind of do a little dummy array that we're going to return from the endpoint, then we're going to hit a live data source through a mechanism I created in a previous video. In other words, we're going to hit a service layer that calls on a live JSON stream. We're going to be able to filter that JSON stream based on a search term. We'll do all of that in this video so we can get this autocomplete working. In a follow-on video, we're going to see how we can take this data that we're getting externally, some JSON data, and store it locally so we do not have to hit a network call every time the user presses a key or makes a keystroke. That being said, let's jump right in. We'll start by modifying our existing autocomplete on this HTML page. So you see right now it autocompletes with just three predefined items, but we're going to feed it dynamically. This page is represented by start.html in our project. So first of all, you see the values that we're currently using. Now, one change I'm going to make, look at what's highlighted and you see it's surrounded by square brackets. That tells jQuery that it's using a local source of data. I'm going to change this, just remove the square brackets and I'm going to change it to a word in quotes. We'll call it something like plant names autocomplete. Now what it's doing is it's assuming that's an endpoint that is running locally on my application. And that's an ideal situation because we don't have to worry about any kind of course compliance here or anything like that. As a matter of fact, it's a good thing that we read that 
plant JSON stream into our service so that we can emit it back out and make it a source for this autocomplete, which is what we're going to do. Only one other thing I'm going to change here, which is the min length of three, because each time the user types a letter above the min length, it's going to trigger a call to that endpoint, which might trigger a network call if we're not caching. This is going to go against a list of about 6,000 plant names, which is a fair amount of data. So let's go ahead and bump it up to min length three so we get at least three characters before we start filtering down. That's all we need for this HTML page. We know we're going to need an endpoint called plant names autocomplete. So I'm simply going to copy that and go to my controller. Let's go ahead and add a new endpoint towards the bottom. We'll start by defining a method. We'll say public. Now what's it going to return? Well, remember, up until this point, our jQuery autocomplete had been using a string array. So we will use something somewhat similar. We'll say a list of strings, which is equivalent to a string array. We might change this later, but for the moment, uh, make that singular string. For the moment, uh, we'll keep it like so. Now we need a method name. Just for convenience, I'm going to name it the same as the endpoint. It doesn't have to be the same as the endpoint, but it can be. Why not? So a couple of annotations I need. First of all, we know this is returning a list of strings, but we specifically need it to be JSON formatted. So let's say at response body, and that annotation simply says, take whatever the return value is from this and make it look like JSON. Next, let's do a request mapping, or we could even do a git mapping if we want. And then we simply put in our endpoint name, like so. Now we can start to put some logic inside of this endpoint. One other thing that we want to consider that's kind of an interesting consideration is that when we had our local data, the jQuery JavaScript magic was able to filter that list when the user started typing. However, once we start going against an endpoint, jQuery no longer does that. Instead, it passes to us a word or a string rather that represents the characters that the user has typed to this point. And that word is stored in a name value pair with a name called term. We need our endpoint here to accept a query parameter called term. So let's call string term. That defines term as an implicit parameter of this method, just like any other method in Java. But we need to marry up this implicit parameter to the query parameter, or in other words, the name value pair that's going to be coming across from our page from the jQuery autocomplete. So for that, we need another annotation that's going to be right here in this method signature. We'll simply say request param. Remember, that's a way we can get any of those name value pairs that come across as get parameters, essentially. Then we'll say open paren value equals term. So for the name value pair, what's the name? We're saying the name is going to be term. Is it required? It's not required in this case, but I can't imagine a case where it's not going to be sent since this is called from our autocomplete. But nonetheless, we'll say required equals false. And then default value, which means if nothing's passed in, what do we use? Let's just use empty string. And with that, now we have defined our term. Let's start with a simple proof of concept where we're not going to worry about filtering by term, but we are going to have enough logic where we can set a breakpoint and we can confirm that we're seeing the characters we expect to see in that word term. We can also confirm that we're going to be passing back data that will populate that autocomplete. So as I say, this will be a bit of a quick and dirty that we'll come back and refactor in just a moment. Let's start by declaring a list of suggestions. We'll make that a new array list and import. And now we'll simply say suggestions add red cedar. So you see here, I have created a collection of plants that all have the word red in them. Right now it's hard coded and we know that we eventually want to hit against some live data. We're just testing out the concept at the moment. I've restarted the application and take a look at what happens when I start typing the word red into the plant field. If I keep typing red bud, you see it's not actually filtering it down. However, you will notice that it doesn't give me anything on the first or second key. Only the third key, which is the min length, will give me any information. We've confirmed that the autocomplete is working. Let's confirm that we see a search term in this term parameter that we set up just a moment ago. So uh, I have it right here. I'm going to go ahead and press B. And sure enough, when I press B, we see that our breakpoint hits 
And when a breakpoint hits, we can take a look at what is in that term variable. And you see it's redb, which if we go back and confirm on my browser, sure enough, that is what I entered. So that proves to us two things. Number one, whatever we type in here is going to be in that term name value pair. And number two, every time we type something there, it's going to call our endpoint, which might end up doing a network call. I'll press F9, let this continue. Meanwhile, speaking of network calls, let's go ahead and wire this up to the network. And we're going to hit a JSON stream of plant data, which is available from plantplaces.com. And we know we can filter with this combined name parameter, so I can go from oak to maple or anything else like that. And we've also already consumed this in a previous video. So we have the retrofit DAO, the DAO, the retrofit client instance, so on and so forth, that we use to read that in and make that available to our specimen service. And then we can call our specimen service from our plant diary controller, which is where we are, are right now. As a matter of fact, if we take a look at this plants endpoint, you see that it is invoking specimen service dot fetch plants, and it's passing in a search term. And that search term is what goes up and becomes that combined name parameter that we saw up in the URL. If you remember the parameter where I typed in oak and then I changed it to maple, that's what that search term is going to become. And that is exactly what we need down here in our method. I'll start by simply deleting or taking out the stub that we created earlier. We'll replace it with our call to specimen service dot fetch plants and we're going to pass in that search term. Now, note that the parameter up here is called term, where the one I pasted in is called search term. Let's just make these one and the same. We'll call them term, just like so. Now, fetch plants, hold Control alt and press V, and that will return to us a list of plants. One trick here is that fetch plants could throw an exception because it has to go down and eventually call that JSON RESTful endpoint that we saw earlier. That's outside of the scope of our JVM, so we have to handle a, catch, uh, a checked exception. So Alt-Enter, it gives us a few options here. I'm going to surround with try-catch, and there are some best practices around what to do with an exception. Number one, you should log it. Number two, uh, you should inform the user, but in the user's words. You don't want to give them technical details. We'll cover all of that in a separate video. So at the moment, I'm just going to take the cheap way out, the unapproved method. I'm going to do an ePrint stack trace, and then I will return new array list string with nothing inside of it. So remember that this is what's going to populate our jQuery autocomplete. Well, we can normally invoke the toString method on an object to get a string representation of the object. I found that that format doesn't work very well with the jQuery autocomplete. So we do want to keep the return type as a list of strings, and we want to convert our plants to strings in a fairly straightforward format. So let's do a for each loop, and we're going to say plant, plant, in plants, and tidy things up just a bit here. And what we're also going to need to do is define a list of all plant names. And we'll create that as a new array list, kind of like the return type we had before. In hindsight, maybe I should have kept that. But nonetheless, all plant names, there we go. And then let's say all plant names dot add plant dot Actually, you know, we could do it too. That we could just wrap up the two string here. Why don't we go ahead and try that? We'll put the two string into that array list of strings. And then finally, when it's all over, return all plant names. It's generally not a good idea to have multiple returns in one method, and it is a good idea to put a return at the bottom. So I'm going to do a bit of refactoring here. Uh, but here again, I'll say when I can implement some best practices on that catch block and do some actual logging and error messaging, we can clean that one up and this will be a bit of a nicer method. But nonetheless, let's see what we have so far. I refresh the page. Let's see what we have. I type in R and we don't see anything as we expect because we have a min length of three. E, nothing again. Then I type in D and take a look at all of the plants that have the word red in them. Quite a few, and you know this is more than just that hard-coded data that I put before. This is actual live data that we're receiving here. If I keep filtering down R-E-D, B-U-D, we'll see we'll get only the red buds, and even then there are several red buds, probably about 15, 16 red buds here. 
A couple more considerations. First of all, we now have this list in a much more user-friendly manner because we're using words, not numbers. So one thing that we can do is show only the word and then submit only the number when the user selects something like Eastern Redbud and then submits the form. So the number is easier for us to deal with as a computer because they tend to work better with things like database lookups and unique IDs and the like, where users are used to seeing words in their own native language. So we'll explore that in a future video. One other thing to consider is that every time I press a letter after the second letter, it's doing a network call, which is very expensive given the number of times I can do a key press in this form. So we also want to take a look at some caching data, how we can keep a local copy of the data and not have to do a network call each time. That topic is a big topic just like the one of hiding the ID and submitting the ID is a big topic. So those are both things that we will cover in future videos. But in this video, we saw how to take a normal jQuery autocomplete and change it from using a local array to using an endpoint that can provide dynamic data. So I hope this video was helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you. Different variations of the Redbud tree. So we've seen in this video how we can create a jQuery autocomplete that connects to an endpoint, and that endpoint can serve up some live data. In our case, we're simply fetching that from another source over the internet. A couple things we can add on to this that we'll take a look at in some future videos. Number one, we should really do some caching because every time I press a key, it's downloading that entire data set and doing the filter all over again. So look at some way we can do some data caching. One other thing that we want to do is that we finally have this in a form that is more user friendly, where we're showing words and numbers next to them, but it used to just show numbers. Remember, we just used to have the number 84 in there, but now we have a name and a number. One other thing we want to do is have it so that the user just sees the name and then the number gets submitted when the form is submitted. So both of those topics are big topics which we'll cover in a future video. Meanwhile, I hope this one's been helpful and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.